bless his heart. I think he's backsliding. I think I saw him drink. Yeah, but in moderation. I just wasn't seeing much fruit. He's going down a slippery slope. How's your heart, man? How's your heart? I'm just such a words guy. It was a total God thing. I'm blessed. I've been working on my testimony. Is that secular music? We're opening with a secular song tonight. Wait, is this a secular song? Isn't she secular? Which station's The Fish? 104.3, The Fish. Safe for the whole family. You know he's a believer. I think he's saved. I just pray you would give him traveling mercies. Pray for all Tyler's unspokens. Mm, echo that. I just really like to echo Tyler's prayer, Father. I just, I echo that echo of my echo of his echo. I really feel like I'm being released from this, you know? I'm trying to be relevant. I'm just trying to be in the world, not of it. Hey, do you want to join our small group? You want to join my D group? You want to join my cell group? Community group? Access group? Accountability group? Acts 27 group? Dude, he brought it. He brought the word. That service last night rocked me. They're pretty purpose-driven. Yeah, it's seeker. Don't they do seeker service there? I feel like he's gotten really watered down. I don't feel like he really teaches the word. There's not enough meat, you know? Are they non denom We have a great Wednesday night supper. Let's invite some dudes over and fellowship tonight. We're gonna have a sweet time of fellowshipping tonight. Dude, we had the sickest fellowship last night. We're going to extreme. Velocity. Ignite. Yeah, I'm going to ignite. The edge. The dive. The bridge. The ramp. Fire. Courageous. Passion. Echo. Reverb. Noise. Velocity. Drive. Elevate. Radiate. 722. 635. 419. Orange. Blue. Yellow. Green. Clear. Neon. Not cool. I find that offensive. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Listen, we have the sickest experience planned for you today. Whether you're here in person or you're online, we're super excited that you're here with us. Listen, we're in this new series and we're talking about the things that we say, the things that we don't say, and even sometimes the things that we think God has said, and we're trying to bring some clarity to all of that. We're super excited. I hope that this experience um, touches you, that it actually starts a transformation in your life. You see, here at Gateway Church, our mission is to help you take a step in the right direction. And so whatever way possible, we hope that we're able to do that with you. If you're joining us online and you actually happen to be a part of the Kamoka campus, I just want to let you know that they're actually streaming their own experience right now. And so if you want to see some more familiar faces, you can jump onto their live stream and show them some love, some love. Well, like I said, our experience is going to be one packed with worship and a message coming on later with Pastor Rick. If you're in the room and you have students that are in preschool or elementary school, you can go back there, grab yourself a tablet from one of the ushers. They'd love to get you set up with their online experience. If you're watching online, this is available for you as well off of our website. You can jump on there. It is amazing preschool and elementary school experience. If you're watching online, you happen to be a part of the middle school group. There's also an experience for you as well. You can find that online under the student tab on our website. We're really excited for that. But I'm really excited because me being the youth pastor, we actually get to open up starting this week on Thursday, starting with middle school students. I love it, man. I love that we're super excited about that. And so if you're watching online, middle school is this coming up Thursday. And if you're here in person, we actually get like a preamble. We're going to hang out today during the service. Looking really forward to that later on. Let me go ahead and pray right now, and we'll jump into some worship. God, thank you so very much for technology that allows us to stay connected, whether it be online or in person. God, I ask that you take these next few moments and do what only you can do and start a transformation in our hearts and in our lives, God. Take these next few moments, God, and show us how much you truly love us. In your name, we all say amen. Whether you're here in person or online, go ahead, stand on up and worship with us. Come on, let's worship together this morning. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we Praises he hears. Oh, oh, he hears your faith today. Come on, let's sing. There is a sound. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Sing his praise. 
and declare this is what living is like. This is what freedom is like. This is what heaven is like. Come on, sing it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. What fear can I survive?
Spirit breathing holy fire within my ever present help speaking truth when I can't find it. Light up this broken heart and my way to my time on earth is done. defend ourselves that you are our defense oh how we need you this morning God may that be the prayer of our hearts today Lord as we keep our eyes as we keep our focus on you today God you are a good good father we love you today In Jesus name amen Thank you so much for joining us in worship, whether you're here online or in person, you can go ahead and grab 
yourself a seat. Well, if you're new here, I'm really excited that you're with us today. If you're joining us online and you're new, we're super excited that you're tuning in. Listen, if you're new, we'd love for it to get to know you a little bit more. And so if you want to fill out a Connect card online, if you hit up connect.wearegateway.ca or if you have the app already, you can jump on there and do the Connect card there. If you're in person, you can just meet us at the Welcome to the Family sign back there. Love to say hi at the Connections Room as well if you get a chance to stop by. Thank you so much for your generosity for those who give. Uh, it helps us just do what God, what we believe God is asking us to do in our community. And so thank you so much. The ways to give are jumping up on the screen over here. So feel free to choose your best method for you, whether it be right now, online, or sometime in the weeks to come. Well, Easter is right around the corner. I don't know about you, but I am excited. Easter happens to be one of my favorite seasons in the year. And this year, we're actually doing it a little bit different where our Good Friday experience and our Easter Sunday experience are actually going to be different from each other, but we'll be offering them at the same time at both locations, so both here and in Kamoka. So our Good Friday, we have two experiences, 930 and 1115, and we have guest speaker Van Johnson joining us, who's a phenomenal speaker, really excited about that. And then on Easter Sunday, we have three experiences, 930, 1115, and 1 p.m., and Pastor Rick will be bringing on an awesome Easter Sunday message for us. Also this year at our Easter experiences, both locations, we are hoping to do a water baptisms, and I love seeing people proclaim their faith in Jesus. And so if that's you today and you haven't been baptized before, whether you're here in person or online, we encourage you to fill out the form that you can find on our website, just on the top left of the website there. would love to get you baptized so we can encourage and join you in celebrating that awesome step that you can make. And we encourage you as well, Easter is not a time to keep to yourself, but invite a friend, a, a family member, a co-worker to join one of these experiences with you. And so we're actually anticipating some increased numbers for the, um, the Easter Sunday experiences. And so we're actually going to be doing registrations um, for both locations for the Easter Sunday. And so more information will come up on that, but that's just so we can best prepare for the Easter experiences coming up. Well, why don't you go ahead, turn your attention to this video we have for you. And if you're in middle school in person right now, meet me in the back over there. If you're online, one of the students, preschool, elementary school, and middle school, you can jump on your experience off the website for now. <laughs> You can't eat too much candy. I love the sound of my alarm clock. Oh, I wish it was Monday. is going by so slowly. Your socks look great with your sandals. Can I work this weekend? That mask brings out the color of your eye. Prius. <laughs> Whoa, that's too much bacon. God wants me to be happy. Well, welcome. Good to have you all with us here today. Let me just say right at the outstart, my apologies to all the Prius owners in the building and online. We love Prius. Said no one ever. <laughs> Glad that you're with us here today. This, uh, before we dive into our message today, let's talk a few minutes and, and just take a, a short moment to talk about Easter. This is a time when we always try to put our very best foot forward in sharing the powerful message of God's love and redemption for all people. Last Easter, as you remember, was a very difficult time. We were in that first phase of the extreme lockdown. People were very nervous. People were scared. The, the masses were having a very difficult time, as were we. We were trying to do online better. I remember, uh, you know, being in my basement trying to film the Easter message, and it's kind of like I'm dressed halfway up, and the other half I was 
in boxer shorts or I don't know what I was wearing and, and I got my iPhone and it's sitting on a kitchen chair and I've got the kitchen chair uh, propped up on a kitchen table with books behind it and I'm, I'm trying to set this thing all up and trying to be profound about the Easter message in the empty tomb and I pray I never ever have to do an Easter message in my basement ever again. I never want to repeat that. May I encourage you today that you would begin to pray now for the people in your life who need to hear the message of Easter. At no other time other than Christmas and Easter, people are more sensitive to hearing the gospel message. And for those of you who are ready and willing to come back, we are planning the services, as Charles has already said, three in Kamoka, three here, in order to make room, but not just room for you. We're making room for your friends and your neighbors. We're making space for them. We're making a place for them so that in a way, Way that is safe and responsible, people can come and experience something in person that you can't really experience online. Now, to those of you who are Jesus followers, may I remind you of the mission. May I remind you of why we are here on this earth, that we are, we are here to share the good news of Jesus to others. And without that, without that mission, without that message, we have no heavenly reason to be here. So who can you invite? If not to your home, think about it. It's safer to bring them here, to invite them here, and that's why we're taking the reservations. I've told the staff that we will make a room for as many experiences as necessary. If we fill this up, we will add more services. I am ready to speak all weekend if necessary, but we will make room for as many as needed so that we can share in a safe and responsible way the Easter message. So who? Who is up to you? Who is that person that is lonely, that is lost, that needs to hear the message of love? Whoever that person is, in your mind right now, in your heart right now, let's begin to pray for them. Father, in Jesus' name, for every person that's in the heart and mind of those who are followers of Jesus today, I pray that your Holy Spirit will begin to convict, will begin to speak to them, will begin to stir something up. I pray for boldness in the lives of those who are listening here and online, that they'll actually have the courage to, to reach out to their friends, to reach out to their neighbors. I pray for those that are a little bit nervous about all of that's been happening here and say, you know what? This is the time. This is the day we're going to take a step out. We're going to come on Easter. We're going to bring our neighbors and friends and we're going to invite them to hear this powerful message. So speak, Holy Spirit, into the hearts and the lives of those who have ears to listen today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So we're in this series and it was called uh, Said No One Ever and we're looking at the cultural beliefs um, that people have, especially Christians, who get into their heart and into their head about what God has declared and what, uh, how God behaves in their lives. And of course, the hitch is, God never said them. These are the things that we think God said or that we think that God behaves, and yet God has no indication that that's how he thinks or he behaves. And last week, we looked at a really big one, uh, one that people say all the time, God will never give you more than you can handle. The reality is God never said that, never did. He actually says and does the opposite. I believe that God will always give you more than you can handle because if you can handle it, then you don't need God. And when you ask Jesus into your life, you're entering into a dependence upon him. And so he will actually do the opposite. He'll give you more than you can handle because the reality is when it comes to life, you're not supposed to handle it on your own. We allow him to hold that which we cannot hold. We allow him to handle that which we cannot handle. Because when you can't handle it, he can and he does. I'm going to encourage you, if you didn't get that message, go on back, check it out, listen to it. Today, today we're going to talk about what may be one of the more, most popular misbeliefs about God in our Western version of Christianity, or Western culture. Simply put, that God wants you and me to be happy. That above all else and at all expense, God is looking for your happiness. That God only wants to do good things in your life, to have good happenings in your life. And he doesn't want anything bad to happen in your life. Because for you, if you believe this, the bottom line is God wants you to be happy. And it's tied so closely to last week's messages. But there are some subtle differences that we're going to look at today. As I said last week, the truth will make you free. And sometimes it's these wrongly held beliefs that, that cause us to see God in our circumstances in such a way that it actually contradicts the nature and the character of God. So that when our world falls apart 
or when God doesn't meet up our expectations, we end up feeling trapped or buried under a, a burden of chaos and confusion uh, by something that God never intended for you to live by. And so if you live by some of these creeds, when they don't stand up under the pressure of time, then all that happens is, is you begin to realize that God isn't what you had hoped to be. And so if you believe that God's supreme goal for you is your happiness, then there are some things that eventually will begin to happen in your life. The first thing is this. If you believe that God wants to make you happy, then whatever makes you happy must be right. And whatever makes me unhappy must be wrong. If you believe that that's what life is, if that's what God's goal is, is to make you happy, then anything that makes you happy has got to be right. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things that make me happy. <laughs> They're not right. Am I, am I the only sinner in the room here today? Come on, you people. Number two, the reason that we believe this is we start end up believing that discomfort or delay or risk or suffering or any obstacles in life can't possibly be the will of God. If you begin to believe that God's goal is our happiness, then, then anything that is uncomfortable, any kind of delay, any kind of shortcoming happens to, can't possibly be the will of God. And there's a third reason that happens, or a third thing that begins to happen when you believe this. And perhaps it's the most problematic or the most difficult practice of this, without even knowing it. And again, it's not a conscious thing. But if you believe that God wants you happy, then without even knowing it, you'll begin to worship the gods of comfort and money and pleasures and things. Now, I'm not saying that we start bowing to our cars or bowing to our boats or our toys, but ever so subtly, what happens is our values will begin to drift. If you believe that happiness is the goal, if God wants you to be happy, then what happens is your values begin to drift. And we embrace a belief that our happiness is our entitlement, that it is our right, that as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, as a Canadian, ultimately everything should lead to my happiness. And when we believe that, then above all else, then suddenly we are led to believe that God exists to serve us. And what happens is we make that a belief, we make it a value, then we make it a truth, that God exists to serve me and to make me happy. Now please don't miss this today. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. Come on now, does somebody, is somebody with me here today? I mean, I, I'm staring here at a two-dimensional sheet of, of masks and faces. So if you were with me here today, I need a little, woohoo, I need some kind of motion. You know, yeah, let, work with me here today, people. Work with me, you're killing me. I'll tell you, I, I need to see some kind of reaction because all I've got is stone beady eyes. You stare at 150 of that. If, if there we go, that's what that somebody's there with me. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. And if God is there to make me happy, then all of a sudden, we reduce the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the, the holy one of God, down to being little more than a cosmic Coke machine. Now, you know what happens with a Coke machine. You take your money, you walk up to a Coke machine, you put your money in the machine, you do your part, and then you press the button and you select Sprite or Coke or whatever you want, and when you press that button, you expect to get your Coke. Contra contractually, the machine must give me exactly what I asked for, and if we don't do it, we, we don't necessarily do this always consciously, but what happens is we reduce God down to some kind of a formula. And, and, and we don't think about it in this, these ways, but what, what happens is, is that if, you, if God is for my happiness, then, then all of a sudden, I, I, God, I did my part. God, I said my prayers. God, I, I go to church. I, uh, I tried to do good things. Uh, I tried not to do bad things. I put a little bit of money in the offering plate. I, I helped that little old lady across the street. I, I dodged my neighbor's cat and didn't run it over, even though I really wanted to. I, I've done all of these good things. So the headaches should be going away. God, after everything I've done for you, I, I should be married happily. 
I should get that job. I, I should have that dream home. I should have that opportunity. I put my money in, God. I put my prayers in, God. I volunteered, God. I pressed the button. God, you should do what I want you to do for me because you exist to make me happy. Now, here's the tragedy of this misbelief. So many people end up walking away from God totally and completely for all of the wrong reasons. Because of this wrong belief, when you don't get what you put your money in or your time in or your prayer in or your effort in, when you don't get what, what you believe that God owes you, then the result of which is people just walk away from God and they say things like this. I tried church. Didn't make me any happier. I went to Gateway. Oh, it was fun for a couple of Sundays, but you know what? It's more fun to stay at home. I'd rather go to Grand Bend. I get more happiness when I worship God in the nature of the beach. You know what? I tried religion. It didn't work for me. I tried the God thing. I even went to a connect group. I got involved. I read the Bible for a month. And I still have cancer. Uh, I, I've been serving, but my kids are still a mess. I gave the church a try. I gave God a try, and I'm not better off financially. I still don't have that job. And if you believe that God exists to make you happy, and you're not happy, then it forces you to only one conclusion, that God failed you. And the reality is God didn't fail you. You started off with the wrong presuppositions. You started off with the wrong beliefs which over time will lead you into a very dangerous place. And I will be really honest with you, and I'll be honest with those who are online. So many people throughout this COVID experience, and I've been, I've been watching and reading as many articles as I could as a pastor and, and tried to pay attention to this, but so many people have gotten out of the habit of making their faith a priority. And when we thought that the COVID or we thought that this pandemic would drive people into cultivating a deeper relationship with God, what we found is the opposite. People are not praying more. They're praying less. They're not reading their Bible more. They're, they're, they're reading less. They're not watching... Uh, television online. They're not doing anything. I'm so fearful that so many people at the end of this craziness, whenever that comes to an end, they'll be finding themselves saying things like this. I don't really miss church. You know what? I, I, I don't miss my community. <laughs> they were hardly there for me anyways. Everybody was kind of all locked up in their rooms. No one called me. See, faith was seven or an eight out of ten beforehand, but now it's just a drift. Now it's kind of four out of ten. Maybe I'll come back. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure. It just doesn't make me happy anymore. I'm no more happier than I was before, so what's the point? The point is this, that all of this doesn't exist for your happiness. It doesn't exist for your pleasure. All of this and all of you exist for him. He doesn't exist for us. We exist for him. He's the creator. We are the creation. He created us for him and we are called to serve him. He does not serve us. Now don't get me wrong here today. I, I, I believe that God delights in your happiness. I believe that God delights in joy. I'm not, I'm not saying at all that God is not, that God is somehow against you enjoying life. Because when you're happy, I believe it brings him joy, just like any parent who delights when a, a child has joy or happiness. When my daughter played soccer and she'd get a breakaway and she'd go for that winning goal and she'd score the goal and she was running around and cheering and, and everybody was screaming her name and Cheryl and I were on the sidelines and we were cheering and of course I'm happy and I'm happy that she's happy and, and you know what, everything is great and wonderful. But her ultimate happiness was not my priority. So if in her happiness and her joy, Gabby runs across the opposing team and along the sideline goes, nah! all of a sudden, the happiness of that goal is not so important anymore, is it? Especially for a father. See, as her father, I have a higher value. Does that make sense today? See, many of us treat God like, hey, 
I should be happy no matter what. And it doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter what I say or do. And this is why I'm going to argue all day long that God does not want us to pursue happiness. God wants us to pursue him. God does not want us to pursue happiness as a goal. He wants us to pursue him. And we don't pursue him for the byproduct of happiness. We are not pursuing him so that he'll give us what we want. We're pursuing him for who he is, period. No strings and no yabats. So let me show you two specific reasons why God does not want you happy. Two reasons why God does not want you happy. Now, I gave you two reasons last week why God wants to give you more than you can handle. Today, two reasons why he does not want you to be happy. Now, I, 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 don't you love this? I know I'm just messing with everybody's theology, and I realize this is hard for some, so just hang with me. And if not, you know what? Thanks for coming to Gateway. There's lots of other wonderful churches in the city. But two reasons why God does not want you happy. Number one, God does not want you happy when it causes you to do something that is wrong or unwise. God does not want you to do something to make you happy when it is sinful or stupid. So many people believe that, uh, that to do something that they, they believe is going to make them happy and, and, and we're going to enjoy this and yet it's wrong. It's unwise and it's foolish. And here's the fundamental problem that so many people believe. They, they read the Bible with their own contextualization in their own heads. And so when they look at a Bible verse, they read it something like this. 1 Peter 1, 15, for instance. They would, they'll read it something like this. Say it with me out loud. But just as he who called you is happy, so be happy in all you do. Is that what Peter says? No, that's not what Peter says at all. Peter says this. But just as he who called you is, so be in all you do. You see, it's just the way in which you read it. And when we believe above all else that God wants us to be happy, then we end up doing things that are wrong and unwise, all in the pursuit of our happiness. I mean, every time I do a wedding, I say these words as a reminder to the two people that are standing in front of me. I say words like, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, until death to us part, keeping myself only for you. Please understand, I, I'm a pastor and I truly care about people and I care about relationships, but I also care about a higher value. And happiness is not in the cards, at least in the vows. I have never led anybody in vows of marital happiness. For 35 years, I have led people in vows of marital holiness. Now understand, I'm not trying to beat up on anybody who has walked down the road of painful divorce and separation and infidelity and all these things. I'm trying to keep others from that. You know the pain. You know the, how much it hurts when a marriage begins to crumble. You've watched children that, that go through horrible results and, and, and the scars on the lives of children and teenagers because mom and dad parted ways or mom and dad got a divorce simply because they weren't happy. God's calling in your life is not for your happiness. It's holiness unto him. And we can go on in every area of our lives and ask the question, is this about my happiness or my holiness? Is this about what I want or about what God desires for me? Am I going to opt for filthy or funny when it comes to my Netflix habits? Oh, don't preach on that, Pastor. Let's, let's, let's sing another song. Oh, you got to check out this series. It's so funny. Now, there's some parts of it. It's filthy. Like, it's dirty. Oh, my goodness. You should see what all on the screen is. But it's funny. I mean, come on. It's funny. You just got to overlook all those things. You might, no, you won't fast forward it. You're going to watch it. But hey, it's a little filthy. But God, it's funny. Because funny is the priority. You okay out there? Am I going to live my life so that it's measured by sacrifice or by personal satisfaction? And let me clear today, those who are, who are tuning in to those of you who are sitting here today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower here today, please make fun of me. Please make fun of me because if I was not a Christian, I'd be making fun of me too. I mean, yes, 
I am the prude. Yes, this is the conservative pastor who is preaching, who is narrow-minded, who is stuffy, who is unprogressive, who is not, come on, Rod, Pastor, get over yourself. Quit talking about all that holiness stuff. We're supposed to be happy. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to understand that we have a higher standard and a standard that's not of our creation or our design or a dictate, or of our happiness. So that's the first reason. Second reason that God does not want you happy is when it is only based on the things of this world. God does not want you happy when it's always based on the things of this world. Isn't it amazing, the internet, I'm not a big, I'm probably not as tech savvy as many of you today, but I'm always amazed at how the internet and Instagram and Facebook, how they read my mind is it just me? Like, like, it, like it doesn't matter. It's like if I think something, all of a sudden it begins to appear everywhere. Like, like yesterday, um, like in the fall last year, I broke the wheelbarrow. So Cheryl was saying to me yesterday, weather's getting better. You need to get a new wheelbarrow. And so she's just talking to me. I'm not on the phone. She's on the phone. She's looking at Lowe's and Rona and all the places to purchase a wheelbarrow. What's a good price and a good size and, and all of those things. And, and, and she's looking at this and I'm going, okay, yeah, if we need a wheelbarrow, we need a wheelbarrow. I then turn my phone on and open it up. And what do I see? Wheelbarrows. I didn't type in wheelbarrow. All of a sudden, Facebook is selling me wheelbarrows. And and Instagram is showing me pictures of wheelbarrows. I wish she had typed something better in than a wheelbarrow. (laughs) Were they in the room? Isn't that just a little creepy? But it's amazing how media uh, these days... It's like they're sitting around thinking up ways to put stuff in our heads to show us that we need, we want these things because those things are going to make us happy. And the mantra of our culture, the the guiding principle to our culture is just this. Better possessions plus peaceful circumstances plus thrilling experiences with the right relationships and the perfect appearance, that will bring me happiness. If you can just have all of the right stuff, the things that you want, and and, and you can create all of the luxuries in your life so that you can have as much feng shui as you can, if you can have all of the toys that will bring the greatest thrills throughout your summer, uh, uh, summer vacation experiences, if you can have just the right relationships and look the right way, you're going to be happy. If you have all of that, you're going to be happy. The problem is, is that all of these things are based on happenings. And happenings change, don't they? Which is why... None of these things will always make you happy because you're never really, really happy all of the time with all of these things because none of it is dependable. Culture says if you buy this, if you have this, if you trade this in, if you get the next one, then you're going to be happy. And yet, when you do all of that, you're still not happy. I like what John said, who was a follower of Jesus and in the latter part of his life reflected on this idea of happiness. And here's what he wrote. He said, do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires, they pass away. They're gone. But whoever does the will of the Father, the will of God, lives forever. God does not want you to be happy when it causes you to do something that is sinful or unwise. God does not want you to be happy when it is only based on the things of this world. What does he want? God's highest calling for your life is not your happiness, as much as that's what you really want. His highest calling for your life is not your happiness, but to live a life that is blessed. 
Now, what's really interesting, that God has something on his mind for you that is greater than your happiness. Happiness is based on happenings, but the blessed life is based on the goodness and presence of God in our lives, regardless of what the happenings are. Now, what's really interesting about the word blessed, in the original Greek language, the word blessed is makaros. What's interesting about it is, you know what it translates to in English? More than happy. The word blessed in the Greek language means more than happy. I believe that God wants you to live more than happy. Now, the challenge, of course, is that when I say that or, or when you hear that, most people think that means more money, more perfect health, uh, and so on, or, or more of satisfaction, or, or, or more what I want. But that's not what the blessed life is. The blessed life doesn't mean that you won't have bad days. It doesn't mean that you'll have problems within your family or your children. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that your car is not going to break down. It doesn't mean that, that you won't lose your job. It doesn't mean that our economy won't fall apart. It doesn't mean that your health will not be subject to disease or decay. It doesn't mean that your marriage will not go through some rocky or difficult things. These things happen and a lot more. The blessed life, more than happy, means that you will experience the goodness of God in the middle of some of the most difficult circumstances of life. That your happiness and the blessings of God are not based on a perfect, pain-free life. God never promised that as we discovered last week. He never promises a life that is free from pain or storms or, or seasons of weakness or a life that is absence of troubles. What he does promise is that when there is deep pain, his Holy Spirit will bring comfort. What he does promise is that when the storms threaten to capsize your life or your family, he will bring peace in the middle of that storm. What he does promise is that when you feel weak, when you feel at your absolute, at your wit's end, he will strengthen you and fortify you as your feet are upon him. And when there are trials and temptations that you think are more than you can handle, he promises joy. As I've pastored for a number of years, one of my favorite portions of scripture has been always Philippians chapter four. This is my go-to. My personal go-to is this, rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about everything, but in every situation, with prayer and petitions, with thanksgiving, present your needs and your requests to God. But then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, that will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure and lovely, what is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things because these are the things that will make you happy and blessed. And I believe that regardless of whatever it is that you face or whatever it is that you are about to face or will face this summer, that you can live the blessed life. Because the blessed life is the supernatural peace of God that goes beyond any human understanding that you can comprehend or understand. Let me bring this home. Max Lucado told this story in one of his books. And if you will with me for a minute, use your imaginations and let's go to an ocean side. Let's walk down onto the beach. And in your hands is a fresh fish, fresh out of the water. Now I want you to take that fish and I want you to lay it on the sand. Do you see it there? It's flopping, jumping all over the place. Its gills are gasping as its gills are opening and closing. Its scales are starting to dry up and harden in the heat of the sun and it's, it's, it's desperate. And you have the power to make that fish happy. What do you do? Do you cover him in a mountain of cash? I know, take a whole pile of money and just bury that fish in money. Will that make the fish happy? It's not rhetorical, folks. Will that make the fish happy? No. I know, it's sunny out. So let's get that fish a beach chair and some fine, fine glasses, some nice sunglasses. 
Let's prop that fish up on its chair with, with some sunglasses. Will that make the fish happy? I don't. How about one of those steel can buckets of Coronas sitting in a pack of ice and give them a Playfish magazine? You know, the one with all the fins? That'll, that'll make the fish happy, won't it? How about we wardrobe the fish? How about some double-breasted fins and maybe some people's skin shoes? Well, that, do you think if we clothe that fish, will that bring happiness to the fish? How do you make the fish happy? You put them back in the water. Why? He'll never be happy on the beach. Why? Because he was never made for the beach. He was made for the water. And you and I, you and I are never going to be completely happy on this earth. Because you weren't made for this earth. You were never created for this earth. And I could give you everything that this earth has to offer, but you'll never truly be happy because God never created you for this earth. There'll always be something missing. You were not created for this earth. You were created. You were created for heaven. You were created for him, by him, to be with him in eternity. And our time on this earth is so short. While the, while the years that we experience, it feels so long, it feels like a lifetime. And we toil so hard at all of that which this earth has to offer to make us happy. But it's only for a little while and then we're gone. God was not created to serve you. You were created to serve him. You were made for his pleasure, his happiness. And here's my point today. Perhaps we need to, perhaps what we really need to do is we need to lower our expectations of earth and raise our anticipation of heaven. Maybe that's the secret that we toil so hard lifting our expectations of this earth. Maybe we should lower it. Lower our expectations of earth and raise our anticipation of the glories of heaven. Because life's not about a new car, a new job, or a new house. It's not about a new relationship. It's not about better sex or, or, or a better job or a better career. Because inside your heart, there is a shape. There is a void. And it's a Jesus-shaped void that only he can fill creation and creator the way God intended and you've tried everything you can to fill that with all of these things and even if you're a Jesus follower you're saying why am I not still happy would you think about it today you were not created to be satisfied by this world and again it's not saying that you don't enjoy but that's not where your happiness, that's not where your joy, that's not where your blessedness comes from. Would you pray with me today? Father, I pray for all of us who are here today and we're trying to figure this all out. We, 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 we're not trying to feel bad because we want to be happy. But maybe we're just putting the expectation on the wrong thing. Lord, maybe if we just lower our expectations of what we think the world has to offer and increase our anticipation of what you want to offer, that we will live the blessed life more than happy. May we think about these things as we process them, that we would find ourselves living the blessed life over a happy life that's you today, if you've been thinking about that today, maybe for the first time you've never ever offered your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you. We'd love to help you on your next steps in your spiritual journey. For those of you who are Jesus followers, maybe, maybe in the disturbing of this message, there has been a shift in your heart or your spirit 
lower the expectations of this earth. Increase your anticipations of heaven. And let him make you live the right way. Amen and amen. To, to read some scriptures together with us. So we invite you, whether you're with us online or here in person, we invite you to stand with us and we are going to read some scriptures in closing that bring this home to us today. So let's read together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Celebrate with praises the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us his extravagant mercy. For his fountain of mercy has given us a new life. We are reborn to experience a living, energetic hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish, never be defiled, and never diminish. It is promised and preserved forever in the heavenly realm for you. Through our faith, the mighty power of God constantly guards us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. May the thought of this cause you to jump for joy, even though lately you've had to put up with the grief of many trials. But these only reveal the sterling core of your faith, which is far more valuable than gold that perishes, for even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory, and honor when Jesus, the anointed one, is revealed. You love him passionately, although you have not seen him, but through believing in him, you are saturated with an ecstatic joy, indescribably sublime, and immersed in glory. For you are reaping the harvest of your faith, the full salvation promised you, your soul's victory. Amen.
according to the circumstances around us or the standards of this world, we thank you that in you, Jesus, we are blessed and we are called, we're chosen, we're set apart by you. And so, Lord, today I pray that we will experience and walk in that in a fresh new way, that we will experience that in our everyday lives when we, when we think of you and we think of how you desire to produce in us this life of blessing in spite of our circumstances. Father, I just pray that every person here today and who is with us online would step into something beautiful and new this week looking to you. We surrender ourselves afresh to you and ask that you would do whatever you desire to do with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us today, online, in person. Thank you for worshiping with us, for lifting your voices, for proclaiming these truths. Friends, we pray that you will walk this week in that blessing. You might be able to squeeze a little happiness in there sometimes too, but Walk in the blessing of God this week and know he's with you, he's leading you, and he desires great things for you according to his purposes. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon.